Spielberg would take the cinema world by storm once again with the 1993 release of Jurassic Park, based on the Michael Crichton novel. The film brought a new meaning to the term computer graphics as dinosaurs easily intermingled with live actors. So successful was Jurassic Park that a sequel, Jurassic Park, The Lost World, was released in 1997. For The Lost World, Spielberg received the Rembrandt Award as Best Director. Michael Crichton and I were in my office one day, and I was going to direct a script of his, somewhat about his own life, called ER. And um, we were developing ER as a movie, and I was working on that, and we were taking a break, and I said, so Michael, what else are you doing? You know, what novels do you have in the pipeline? He says, well, I'm doing something that's kind of a big secret, and you know, I love when they say it's a big secret. So I spent the next hour trying to get Michael to tell me the secret. And he finally said, well, if you don't tell anybody, which I never did, he said, I'm, making a, I'm writing a novel about dinosaurs and DNA. That's all he gave me. And I got it. I just sort of got it. And I said, you mean they're coming back? He said, yeah, they're coming back. And I said, please, let me be the first person to read the novel. And he did. He let me read the novel because he wouldn't sell it to me as a producer. He said, if you direct it, it's yours. If you guarantee you'll direct it, he said, He gave it to me as a director. Universal bought the rights. And then the, the screenplay ER was pushed off into the uh, you know, wait and see box. And I made Jurassic Park. And the weird thing is, about three, a year later or so, we dusted e ER off and sold it to NBC, and it became a television series. Oh, wow. Well, the biggest obstacle was how to do the dinosaurs. At first, I was going to do the dinosaurs the old Ray Harryhausen way, which is, you know, stop motion, you know, uh, um, armature claymation figures, you know, one frame at a time. The way King Kong and, you know, the Sinbad movies were made. And, and I, was, I was willing to accept that because I had the greatest animator in the world working on Jurassic Park, a, a man named Phil Tippett, who was a genius at go motion, or stop motion, as it was once known. And then Dennis Murin at ILM said, you know, I'm working on something based on something that you guys actually started, which was the first CGI shot ever put in a movie, which was on a film I produced and Barry Levinson directed, called Young Sherlock Holmes, where this image of a stained glass knight jumps out of, of the stained glass window with a sword and, and accosts his priest. And um, he said, since Jim Cameron did Terminator and The Abyss with those miraculous CGI elements, I think I can create a complete CGI animal, a T-Rex, and any dinosaur you want, but give me a chance to do this. And Dennis went into the lab and began experimenting up there in Northern California, and came back one day and showed me for the first time the first test of a CGI animal, and it was phenomenal. And I think, you know, that the movie and all of my aspirations for it, you know, just sort of turned on a dime, and it became a different movie because of that of an 1839 mutiny on board a slave ship was released in 1997. For his work, he was nominated for a Golden Globe Award for Best Director and the Directors Guild Award for Outstanding Directorial Achievement. It was producer Debbie Allen who vigorously pursued Spielberg and eventually convinced him that he had to direct the film. Well, it's just that Debbie Allen kept saying the same thing to me over and over again. Oh, Stephen, you've got to make this movie. You've got to make this movie. And and, and she kept finding different, different ways of talking me into it. And she finally said, you have to make the movie for your black kids, because she knew I had two black children, two African-American kids. And she was right. I really did make this, make this film for Theo and Michaela. His first reaction was just this insatiable appetite for the history of it. He wanted to know about the people. He wanted to know who were the Africans, what was their religion, what kind of songs did they sing, had they ever seen white people? You know, what was going on in the Supreme Court? Where were we historically with the abolition of slavery? How many years were we before the Civil War? Yeah, I thought it was a story that had to be told. I thought it was also a very compelling piece of American hyphenate African history. Very, very compelling story. And I'm, I'm really attracted not by messages as much as I'm attracted by good stories. And, and I don't care where the story takes place or who it's about. If I find a good story that really you know, you know, you know, won't, won't lay off me, won't leave me alone, then I can't leave it alone. I have to make the movie out of it. I don't want to leave it at all. Stephen could probably have been a writer of half a dozen other things, but he never, um, I don't think he's ever thought of anything else but film since he was 
eight or nine years old, you know. So uh, it's 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 in his genes. It's in bread, you know, and so clear when you're with him on on set. I'm neither friend nor foe of the abolitionist cause. No, I won't help you, sir. What? I know you, Mr. President. I know you and your presidency as well as any man, and your father's. You were a child at his side when he helped invent America. And you, in turn, have devoted your life to refining that noble invention. There remains but one task undone, one vital task the Founding Fathers left to their sons yeah. before their 13 colonists could precisely be called United States. And that task, sir, as you well know, is crushing slavery. Your record confirms you're an abolitionist, sir, even if you won't. And whether or not you admit it, Mr. Johnson, you belong with us. 